analytics of the tech sales insights. Uh, Chris, how you doing? Great. Good morning. Excellent. Thanks for uh, being on with us. Uh, really excited to have Chris McCarthy, longtime consulting services, great go-to-market executive, been around some uh, great companies that you will hear more about. And, uh, you know, typically that consulting services is kind of a kind of sidebar as opposed to core to a lot of companies. I think I'll have some uh, terrific insights of how you can uh, let leverage it to help you sell more. Uh, for those that are members of sales community, thanks. For those that are not, uh, Chris Decker behind the scenes here uh, will hopefully pull up. Uh, you can go to salescommunity.com slash fall free and get a free membership. Uh, Tucker this week is away in Spain on his honeymoon. So I know he's having a great time. And we have uh, Chris Decker from SalesCast uh, pinch hitting. So Chris Decker, thank you very much for your help. Uh, SalesCast is a great partner of uh, sales community. They help with all the great follow on tidbits and slicing and dicing and posting and reposting and all that that we do with these uh, podcasts that you can uh, always look up each week. Uh, also brought to you by uh, X Factor. Uh, they've got an awesome uh, annual operating plan. Uh, so the tagline annual operating plan. So you can always have a great operating plan. And uh, they also have a great from uh, legacy uh, decision link that they had uh, acquired. It's also a great value selling platform. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, value selling later. And then uh, Chris Decker, don't forget if you can post the, um, the uh, salescommunity.com slash fall free, uh, that would be great. So thank you very much for that. Um, Let's see here. So you live in Middlebury, Connecticut. Uh, I grew up, grew up in New Haven, a little, a little close to that. And uh, not only are you a golfer, you're a very competitive golfer uh, with, with a two handicap. So that, that's uh, very impressive. Thank you. Thank we you. Could, uh, we could uh, do some damage with my uh, with my 19. Absolutely. So uh, for uh, in introductions, uh, have uh, we actually had uh, worked together at HP. So you know, really enjoyed that. Great partner in crime. Uh, typically, again, services is kind of pushed to the side. You always did a great job mainstream, making it, let's leveraging, you know, joint go to market. You know, how can we kind of help each other out? How do you leverage that to be a competitive differentiator, which which we'll talk about. And uh, some other tidbits. Uh, whoops. You there? I am. Well, that's weird. Can you see me? I can see you and I can hear you. Okay, that is really weird because I can't. Uh, interesting. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. My, my, <laughs> my screen is blank, but... Uh, I've always been accused of having a face for radio, Randy, so today would be a great day to do that again. <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right, this is weird. I'm gonna, s s hmm, okay. All right, let's keep going then. Uh, anyway, so from uh, Robert Rye uh, says, uh, Chris is a great example of an accomplished business leader that truly knows how to manage all aspects of a P&L to deliver predictable financial results quarter after quarter, a fabulous team player. Uh, Scott Clark, who's uh, here in uh, Wellesley, says uh, Chris is a strong technology industry veteran who is also an outstanding career working for companies like IBM, EMC, Cisco, HP, HPE, and Microsoft, where he's built strong relationships with sales teams, partners, and clients to innovate and deliver real technology-based solutions that drive measurable business outcomes. As such, he has always been a leader focused on customer experience-based selling and services where the value delivered is based on customer results not technology capabilities. And uh, Scott Dunsire, a longtime friend for both of us, says, I've had the pleasure of working with Chris uh, at HPE. Chris is the ultimate team player who listens, partners, and provides valuable insight to solve difficult challenges. And additionally, additionally I've hired Chris as an advisor to help us build out our go-to-market cloud offering. So very cool there. It can probably help out a lot of other companies too, I would think. Uh, his experience, along with his valuable input and relationships, have helped shape what I know will be a successful practice area for us here at Melillo Consulting 
in addition, Chris is a damn good golfer. So <laughs> especially with that, uh, with, with that two there for sure. Um, so let's uh, jump into the question. So uh, college, you went to Concordia College, uh, played varsity tennis, and I guess it is now Iona. Uh, mm -hmm. What was your uh, first job out of college? Yeah, my first job was with IBM. Um, I actually worked uh, all of my summers during college, uh, including my last full year. So I was uh, playing varsity tennis and working at the same time. I uh, don't know how I pulled that off. Uh, I was a second generation IBMer, so both my parents had worked for the company. Uh, and so naturally, that's where uh, that's where mom and dad wanted you to go next. Um, so I ended up uh, with IBM uh, coming out of school. Uh, there, there was a, actually a gap, Randy. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, IBM, uh, this was 1986 time frame, was going through a bit of a tough time <clears throat> financially. And so they had put a freeze on all hiring. And I wanted to work for IBM in the worst way. Long story short, there was a sales rep uh, in the local office that I was in who said, hey, you know, I went to college with a couple of guys who work for this technology company up in Natick, Mass, and they're hiring like crazy. You may want to you know, go interview with them. And so long story short, it was EMC uh, over there on Speen Street in, uh, in Natick. And I uh, went up on a Friday in February. Uh, and it was a snowstorm the night before. It did the full round of interviews, as you probably remember in those days. And uh, at the end of uh, the afternoon, the recruiter said to me, uh, hey, great, great job, uh, looking great. Um, we want to do another round. Uh, would you like to come back again tomorrow? And I said, uh, yeah, to, but tomorrow's Saturday. He says, no, no, I know. We work a half a day here on Saturday. Yeah. And, and, and so I knew I, I was really lining up with a real sales oriented company and uh, spent the morning on Saturday interviewing with some of the Egan fellas. So uh, pretty cool time. Awesome. That's yeah, so a great story. I had uh, I was a we call it telemarketing at the time was a SDR, was BDR. So it was a May, May of 85. I was the 33rd employee. So did that for a few months and then I then I ran that group. So kind of my my, my secret in interviewing was uh, Dick Egan's wife, Maureen, was a receptionist in the, in the front there where you walk in. So we do the interview, everything else. But kind of a, a, a huge factor was, OK, you know, Maureen, how did they treat you? Right. And there'd be some guys who wouldn't give her the time of day, guys or girls wouldn't give her the time of day or just rude or nasty. And even if they interviewed, great. I'm like, all right, forget about it. And then, you know, if they say, oh, you know, what happened? Everybody liked me, everything else. Yeah, yeah. So you really didn't treat our uh, you know, receptions very well, did you? And then, you know, so for a lot of people, I think that was a huge, huge, uh, huge wake up call. And conversely, for those that did, you want those people when nobody's watching, the guard is down, who are authentic, real, nice, pleasant, right? Those, those are the people that you want. So uh, anyway, well, lots, That's of good, cool. lots of good times there uh, for sure. So and then what about um, your uh, go, just go through your uh, career uh, briefly, if you can? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I literally the first job out of college, believe it or not, was selling copiers for IBM. Uh, and IBM was still in that business in those days, uh, about another year and a half, two years. And uh, you talk about, you know, just core, hardcore kind of selling. I mean, it was uh, I'll never forget one of my first uh, business reviews with one of the regional managers. Uh, we got together and uh, I had taken a slide from uh, an old friend that I had worked for when I was in college. And uh, it was very simple. Calls plus demos equal sales, right? It's just get out there, make calls on customers, as many calls as you can make in a day. Uh, try to get them in for a demo. Uh, and that will eventually lead to, uh, you know, some number of sales. And so, uh, um, you know, my background started in as hardcore in, in that business as you can get. And, and, and in those days, Kodak and Xerox were the players, not IBM. Wow. Then I went on. So after IBM sold that business uh, to Kodak, interestingly, uh, I then went through the traditional IBM training program, came out a year later, got a territory, sold uh, mid mid range systems, AS 400s and RS 6000s and, you know, storage and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until several years, uh, quite a few num number of years later that I started to kind of get into this world of services. Actually, it was 12 years later um, that I really started to kind of move into that world of services uh, inside of IBM before I left and then went over to EMC, uh, where EMC was building up a services business uh, coming out of the 90s. Things were getting a little bit more complicated in terms of the portfolio. 
and uh, so Pat Weber uh, hired me to uh, to lead the Northeast and Canada and uh, did that for a couple of years went into the kind of the worldwide function and then got recruited to Cisco where Cisco was building a uh, storage area networking fiber channel platform they thought I knew something about that so I uh, went over there and had a great run for 10 years uh, at Cisco and uh, midway through uh, I was called one Saturday morning in December, literally sitting where I am right now. And uh, I was asked to stop everything I was doing and get in the middle of uh, taking a look at a joint venture between Cisco, EMC, and VMware. Uh, and uh, here's two PowerPoint slides. We just presented this to Joe Tucci and, and John Chambers and Paul Moritz. And you got 45 days. You're going to go build a small team with EMC and VMware lock yourselves in a room in Hopkinton and come out with uh, a plan to invest in or not uh, in putting together a joint venture. And honestly, Randy, I thought it was going to be one of these typical 45 day go do kinds of jobs. And then I'd go back to what I was doing. It became roughly two years of my life and probably the most uh, exciting and exhilarating uh, two years I've ever had because it was literally a startup well funded but it was literally a startup with a startup culture and you were really putting together a business uh, from the ground up. And of course the legacy there is the business uh, became about a $2 billion business, uh, created a whole new market category around converged infrastructure. Uh, and it gave uh, all parties uh, exactly what they were looking for. If you remember, you probably do. In fact, I know you do. This was at a time when Cisco was coming out with the unified compute platform. Uh, and they had no uh, presence in the data center uh, to speak of. And uh, this was all about uh, getting that, that foot into the data center with you know, real data center companies like EMC. Did that, uh, left Cisco a couple of years afterwards um, and ended up over at HP, which obviously became HPE. I was leading uh, all of the services in the Americas, working for Robert uh, with Scott Dunsire. And then did that uh, for about four and a half years uh, and then uh, decided I wanted to get into the world of software and cloud and the, you know, the, the new generation of things uh, and ended up over at Microsoft where I had a great five year uh, run uh, leading services and support uh, for the, uh, the U.S. Uh, in the financial services segment. So real brief, uh, uh, quick uh, tour of uh, 35 some odd years of career here. Awesome. That's great. And then now you're um, basically taking that and doing a uh, your own consulting business, right? Tell us about that. Yeah. So I decided, you know what, uh, before I hang it up, I really want to get into or get back into a, a situation like the VCE situation, uh, building something, contributing to something. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily only from the ground up, but something smaller. Uh, of course, everything other than Microsoft is going to be smaller. Uh, but where I could have a much wider uh, impact, uh, maybe more of an operating kind of a role. Uh, and as you, re I think you remember uh, back in the, the springtime, you and I had a chat and you said, hey, Chris, um, good on you. Uh, wish you luck. Uh, give you all the help I can give you. But here's my recommendation. Uh, go, go set up an LLC. Go get yourself a, a credit card. Uh, start networking with, you know, all the people, you know, in the industry and uh, chances are you're going to have some opportunities to take some of that experience uh, and impart it. And uh, sure enough, uh, that's where Scott and I connected uh, and I'm helping Scott and Mark and their team with uh, a go to market uh, and practice development around a Microsoft practice. And then I've also gotten some work with uh, a small uh, data uh, data mobility software company, um, well known in the industry. Uh, so I'm helping them on a number of partnerships and go to market kinds of activities. Uh, and then interestingly, um, what, what, company, what company? What company is that? Are you uh, called Cirrus Data Solutions. Okay. Yeah, uh, some of the founders from Falcon Store and uh, Cheyenne Software and 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 others. Uh, really great product uh, in that space. And then through just a kind of an interesting relationship, uh, I was asked to work for uh, or, or provide some services to a private equity uh, out of New York. I can't name the, the company, 
uh, but I'm helping uh, some of their uh, managing directors um, who are sitting on the boards of some of these public companies work through uh, some strategy and some acquisition integration stuff that they're they're working with uh, through some of their portfolio companies. So pretty wide and diverse uh, kind of set of things. I never would have expected that uh, when I when I decided to leave Microsoft, but it's uh, been incredibly fulfilling. Uh, and is really testing a lot of uh, experience, knowledge uh, that I've hopefully accumulated over uh, over the career. And I can't thank you enough for your uh, urging of me to do that. Oh yeah, no, no worries. Well, yeah, <laughs> we'll check in a year from now. So, what's what's next for you? Going to keep doing that, or you know, it's a great question. I um, I, I am enjoying that. Um, I do want to get back into a company um, in a little bit more of a permanent basis. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of fine tuning that into size and shape and kind of industry um, or sector, I should say, of, of the tech space. Um, but for now, this is absolutely fulfilling and, and it's, it's keeping the right balance for me. And I think balance is really, really important part, right, is, is finding that right balance of work and play and family and everything else that's going on. Um, and right now this is doing it. But uh, I do think I would like to get back into something on a more uh, on a more permanent basis. Oh, awesome. There you go. All right. Well, companies uh, watching is that uh, would be a great, great find for sure. sure. So our, uh, our uh, title topic is leveraging services and consulting as a competitive advantage. So just to kind of level set, kind of, you know, give us a kind of basic definition first, maybe of uh, the services and consulting. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, pretty much every one of those companies that I've been a part of uh, have evolved uh, their businesses from classic technology into you know, services with solutions, or let me say it differently, solutions that are uh, founded in services. And with the exception of IBM at that moment in time, which had to go into the services business really as a means of survival, um, every one of the other tech companies were in the services business. Uh, I would probably sum it up in one, one or two words, which is really around driving uh, the adoption and or consumption of the technologies. An interesting story. I, um, I remember this vividly. We were in uh, Las Vegas. I was at EMC. And we had a bunch of services sellers uh, in a room for a couple of days uh, of some training. And we invited Joe Tucci to come in and just spend a few minutes talking to the group uh, about EMC, what's happening, the evolution. He had been about a year into the company. And we were asking him to really kind of prioritize services. And, and he stopped and he said, you know what, guys, look, I'll be happy to do all that, but I want to make it clear. We're a technology company at the core. We're not a services company, right? Uh, and if you're asking me to go into that room and tell them that we're a services first company, I'm going to go back to what I was just doing and I'll let you guys do that. And, 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 and I don't think Joe was trying to be flip, but it really, sure. really just solidified for me. Why are we in this business? Right. And what is that purpose? And it's, it's it was all about aligning with your go to market, and your technology and how do you drive success and outcomes with customers based on that technology? And sure enough, went to Cisco, a little bit of a different purpose. Right. They were starting to get into newer technology areas, unified compute, storage, you know, security, a lot of other areas which they weren't known for. And services was going to be a way that would propel them into these new and emerging markets that they weren't really known uh, to be to be uh, a player in. Um, similar story at HP, minus the EDS part of HP in those days, right? That was a different reason. But, you know, the business that we were in, in the product part of the business, it was all about enabling technologies. Uh, and then similarly at, at, at Microsoft. And so... Um, it's it's that adoption and consumption um, purpose that these these companies are in this thing for. And then you layer on top of that the fact that every one of these companies have vast partner ecosystems, right? Mm -hmm. From small bars all the way up to the large GSIs. And, uh, you know, Kevin's topic last week really hit home with me because you have to balance that in that ecosystem. Uh, and how do you balance, you know, a services business, you know, that's that's uh, 
that's that's native, if you will, to the tech company with all of these other uh, partners in this partner ecosystem. And you can do that, right? You absolutely can do that. It should not be uh, uh, an or, it's an and, right? When you're working with them. And, and so you have to have that mindset um, around how do you, you know, extend, leverage, create scale, uh, not just in the delivery, but in the go to market and delivery of these solutions uh, in these, these tech companies. And so it's been a real learning for me over probably the last uh, 20, 25 years since I left IBM, because at IBM, it was IBM or nothing. Right. And, and that was the whole purpose of the services business. But, it, but since then it has been, uh, what I've just described. And, uh, and I think there's a, uh, a further evolution that's happening, you know, in these tech companies where they're moving from, you know, classic professional type services or consulting or whatever you want to call it, uh, and support into this world of customer success. And we can talk about that. Uh, but that to me is, uh, an emerging kind of trend that I'm seeing in a lot of these tech companies. Um, and I think lines up with this notion of value-based selling, outcome-based selling um, that we're, we're talking about today. Gotcha. The, the is interesting, right? So IBM spun out Kindrel, the services business, yeah. right, to do that. But then now I was talking to some folks the other night at Kindrel. Now, you know, IBM's kind of starting to, you know, re-spin re and, and compete, which is uh, interesting. It, very interesting. Confusing and interesting at the same time. Yeah. So you touched on it. So in terms of how you see this evolving, you see it evolving into uh, customer success, the kind of services consulting businesses at the tech companies? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, and you know this, Randy, right? Uh, customers don't buy things. There are customers that do buy things, right? But by and large, what, what customers are looking for are outcomes. And they're looking for partners, tech partners, who are going to be uh, co-invested and willing to co-innovate with them. Right. This is a big, big thing. Right. Uh, especially with where these technologies are going. If you just think about AI, I mean, this is a whole new horizon for, for everyone. Right. And, and there's there's a there's a shortage of talent in the market. And there's a shortage of expertise to deliver on this talent. And so what they're looking for is this co-investment, co-innovation. Um, and part of this is around how do you get to the table and really get intimate with my business, right? And that's not just at an industry and sub industry level, but that's even down into, you know, that very specific thing that that room in the house is dealing with, right? In that customer, um, at that moment in time, and to the extent that you're willing to get down into that level and really think, uh, have a hard think about how to innovate and how to apply the technology that you have to go solve that problem and deliver that outcome. That's where this customer success is coming from. And it's really around stickiness, right? And creating that stickiness of your technology, that, that long-term adoption. Um, and so it's, it's an evolution. And again, it's intended really to be complementary to, in, in these larger tech companies at least, you know, the, the partner ecosystems that they, they, they uh, try to balance, right? From, from small to very large. Absolutely. So now what about the struggles or there's always kind of a tug of war, right? You've got the, I'll say the product, whether it's hardware, software, you got the product sellers yeah. who may not be good at kind of understanding the services side. And then you got the services, you know, kind of sellers, support team, all that, who really does think, hey, we should be services only and we should not be doing that kind of collaboration. You know, there's, it's not an account P&L. It's, hey, we want to, we're worried about our services P&L. So kind of how you've kind of navigated that, those dynamics. Yeah. And every one of these companies uh, that I've gone into, that was uh, pretty much the, the structure. And right off the bat, there's that conflict that, that occurs. And, uh, uh, you know, call me, call me a bit of a masochist in, in this way. I love those, those opportunities, right? Um, because to me, that's the opportunity to create that kind of tissue between, you know, what the product sales organization who's measured in 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 weeks and months and quarters uh and compensated in that fashion uh with the reality that hey services will slow my deal down it's going to put an un unnecessary tax on my deal 
Uh, it's going to complicate things. It might even, you know, distract my customer. And so finding this, this point, this connective tissue between the motivation of selling the technology with, you know, architecting the solution and how do services become part of that earlier in the sales cycle, not as a, as an attachment, a skew attachment at the back end of the sales cycle. And oh, by the way, can it be used as a differentiator to accelerate that, that, that solution and that buy from the customer uh, and oftentimes make it more profitable, obviously make it more sticky. Uh, and then the, the success uh, breeds from there. And to the extent that you can create this kind of multi-generational buy and consumption, mm -hmm. boy, that's Nirvana. Great. And I should have mentioned before, so anybody uh, watching or listening along, feel free to uh, ask any questions. You can see us or hear us. We cannot see you, but uh, we got uh, Chris uh, Chris Decker behind the scenes and he'll uh, pull, up, pull up any of the questions or, or comments. So please feel free to chime in here at any point. Um, so what about, so traditionally you think of services consulting for, I'll say traditional hardware companies, but it's kind of just as valuable, if not more, val more valuable for kind of SaaS and software companies, right? Huge, huge. Uh, because right, look, nobody really ever consumes something quote unquote out of the box, right? It's always, there's always going to be some, uh, customization that's, uh, that's going to go towards that. Um, and it's, what's interesting in the five or so years that I was with, uh, Microsoft, you're really getting down to that um, that atomic level, if you will, with the customer, that buyer, that 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 user, that set of use cases that they're they're in need uh, uh, of of delivering for their for their end customers, and um, you know that that requires very deep understanding of the business, uh, understanding of the challenges, the landscape, who's buying, what they're buying, uh, why they're buying it. Uh, those are the, those are very interesting dynamics, and then being able to architect that solution, and invariably, I would say this as well. You know, Kevin Purcell talked last week about VSEM, uh, vision, strategy, execution, metrics, and I know he was talking about it more in the context of, you know, business plans or territory plans. And yes, those are those are typically the case, but you can apply that same kind of an approach to a customer. Let's be honest, right? There's a lot of customers that that have a vision, right, of of what they're trying to do with the technology. May not be the exact vision that they ultimately deliver to, uh, but they don't necessarily have, or they may not necessarily have a, a fully thought out strategy. Let alone a plan of execution. Let alone how are they going to measure the success of this? So there's an opportunity there to be that, again, I'm going to go back to that partner, that co co innovation, co invested partner that says, look, we're going to, we're going to be on this journey together with you. And I think at the end of the day, that's where customers will, will separate, you know, Phil Castillo used a couple of weeks ago, this, um, this term, uh, commission breath, right. You know, separate, you know, those that have the commission breath who are trying to land something this month, this quarter, with hey there's a longer term relationship and longer term yep. outcome that we're trying to deliver awesome we have a question here from jimmy burns so let's uh we'll break it up in two parts so the first one is uh would you recommend working in a larger company or startup uh my perspective is you know just get in anywhere uh my daughter shannon started at oracle truth be told they try to get her to go to a smaller company but uh you get at the bigger company get good great you know great training great structure uh now she's at a smaller company and with a smaller company you get kind of a a great broad perspective when i started emc uh it was tiny so i had a great appreciation of i knew all the other functional departments, how the company operates. So at the end of the day, I would say don't agonize, pick whatever company you're into in terms of liking the people, liking the culture. And these days, different from when Chris and I grew up, I mean, you know, we used to have to stay somewhere, you know, five or 10 years. These days you can go somewhere for a year, you don't like it, you, you can go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, Chris, what's your perspective on the big company versus small company? Yeah, of course, I'm going to be a bit biased because I've done nothing but uh, yeah. large. Um, and I do totally agree with your comments about, you know, structure. I mean, it, uh, it, you know, starting your career, it's 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 very important. And I think it is even today. 
I don't think it necessarily matters uh, whether it's large or small, um, but I think it's, um, it, you know, it, it, you can build your career and then I think you can have a lot of value, um, you know, taking the large company to, you know, something smaller. I also believe that works in reverse and I've seen that many, many times uh, with people over, uh, over the years. The, the second part of this question uh, is interesting. Um, Jimmy, I, I'm a huge believer, um, ardent, ardent believer. Uh, and, I, and if you look at my resume, you know, I've lived this in my career of rotation. I, I am totally into rotation. Um, and if and if you think about what I mean, what I'm saying there in rotation, you know, rotate from sales into services, into customer success, into a worldwide role, back into a local geographic or country kind of role. Um, it gives you incredible perspective. My first 14 years of career, all of which at IBM, um, 12 of those 14 years were in the field here in the Northeast, uh, sales, sales leadership. And I thought I knew everything and I didn't. And I was kicked in the pants and told your, your time is done in the field. You're not going to get another promotion. Uh, it's time for you to go do quote unquote, a corporate, uh, role. And I did it kicking and screaming. I wish I had done it sooner in my career uh, because all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at the world, not just through the local Northeast. Now you're looking at it through, you know, the U.S., North America, the Americas, traveling and getting perspective on things that, gosh, I, I just I wish I had had earlier in my career. So I'm a big believer of rotation. Um, I live it everywhere I've, I've been. I, I push it uh, with with everyone in my organization. And I'll share a quick story. Um, and, and I don't know if it, it actually was designed this way. When I joined IBM uh, coming out of college, I joined IBM in uh, Hamden, Connecticut, right outside of New Haven, Randy. We probably yeah. knew each other in a few places. And I was fortunate for a very short period of time uh, to work for a branch manager in a branch office at IBM. His name was Sam Palmazano. And Sam eventually became CEO of IBM, as many people know. <laughs> and uh, Sam uh, was uh, great, gracious to uh, do some mentoring for me back in uh, the early uh, days of my career while his career was on fire. And, you know, I remember this uh, vividly, and I've shared this for many years. He said, Chris, your career is like a stair step. Yeah, that's about right, Sam. Okay, got it. What's your point? And he said, you know, you should never try to master every step in the stair in your career. Get to 80%. The last 20% becomes de minimis, right? Do 80%, learn, and then go to the next step. Now, that, that staircase could be really steep, like a staircase in Greece or Italy or up a mountainside. Right? That was Sam's career. Or that staircase could be a typical staircase, or it could be even a flatter staircase. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to this, but, but attempt to master 80% of that because the last 20% is de minimis. Um, and, I, and I actually, as I look back, I think that makes an awful lot of sense, Jimmy. And so uh, rotation is big for me, and getting that diversity of, of experience is huge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my two cents is, uh, I'd say start in sales, because if you know sales, that's keys to the kingdom for everything else. Totally agree with what uh, Chris said in terms of kind of the rotation side. Uh, you can also throw in channel, probably is a, another good one there. And uh, so, some other thoughts on some specific people. Uh, I was talking this morning, uh, Emily Fernando runs uh, uh, marketing at Bug Crowd. She started out as a as an SDR, and we're talking about okay, how valuable is that? No offense to marketing leaders, but most marketing pe leaders didn't carry a bag. They didn't do you know the inside sales thing. So by Emily doing that, it just makes her so much more appreciative, understanding, and effective as a marketing leader. And then on the other side of things, if you want to you figure out, I think what what do you want to do? Somebody like a Dave Donatelli who. Um, known for a long time. He's uh, current CEO of Riverbed, uh, was, was with him here uh, Monday night. And um, you know, he's done, he did a great job over time. He, he had he, you know, kind of sales jobs, he had marketing jobs, had operation jobs, had engineering jobs, product jobs. 
you know, that's an awesome way to get cultivated for CEO or, you know, uh, big company uh, GM type roles uh, as well. And then for those that may not be in sales or you don't really want to have a full time job and they go to market side, uh, I was with somebody at an event in uh, New York, Vicki Lee, who uh, runs finance at Hitachi of all places, uh, that I said, hey, it'd be great if you can be an executive sponsor for some companies. And then that way the, you get a really good understanding for the field and where you're at and uh, you know, what's going on and how you can help. And you know, the sales team would probably learn a lot from you. You, you learn a lot from the, the sales team as well. So uh, anyway, so Jimmy, thanks so much for those questions. Uh, anybody else, feel free to chime in with any comments or questions. So um, I guess to put a wrapper on the services consulting side of things, any, anything else that you'd like to mention? Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, I also, uh, I'll share this, uh, Scott Clark uh, ingrained this into me a long time ago. You know, you can never be, um, you know, you can never convince everyone in the organization of, you know, driving solution services, right? There's always going to be some number of folks. And um, I always, uh, whenever I come into one of these situations, I always uh, coach the team to think about um, finding, you know, if you break up the, the population into thirds, 30% get it right away and are going to drive it, whatever it is right away, right? Those are your adopters, those are your leading edge people, whatever. Then there's 30% who are sitting there waiting to see how the first group do. Right. What's their level of success? And then there's another population, let's say 30, 40 percent that uh, just doesn't get it, never will focus on the first 30 percent. Right. Lead with the first 30 percent, make them wildly successful, use them to showcase the capability, the, the success, the excitement that can be driven. And that will bring along that next 30 percent. And that's what you're going to need. Right, to be successful, right? The other 40%, they're going to just kind of fall off and go away and they're, they're, they're kind of going to do their thing, right? If you focus on that first 30%, and I think this applies not only to the sellers in these mm -hmm. companies, but also even just customers, right? Focus on them, go very deep with them, be successful with them, and that'll lead you to that next uh, horizon of, of folks. And I think you'll be just fine. Awesome. So uh, moving off the uh, title topic, uh, a few other questions. So if you think about uh, mentors that you've had, advice you've received from them, any kind of one or two in particular you want to point out? Yeah, I shared the one on, on Sam already. Um, you know, I think another one um, that I learned a long time ago, um, and actually it was during the whole VCE moment, and, and I'll give you the context here. I didn't, I didn't know how to start a joint venture. None of us did. Right. There are very few companies, tech companies that have ever done uh, joint ventures. At that time, I think the only one that really did was uh, Accenture and Microsoft, Avanade. Avanade yeah. um, and that was actually used as kind of the model of success. So nobody really knew how to do this. And um, as we were going through this, um, you know, you felt as though with the, the, the focus and the exposure from the three companies, the CEO levels, the boards, that you had to have everything right. You had to be right. And Gary Moore, uh, who I was part of his organization, and he actually asked me to go do this. Gary became, he was running services for uh, Cisco, and then he became one of the two co-COOs um, underneath John Chambers. Uh, Rob Lloyd was the other one. And, and Gary's coaching to me one day was, hey, Chris, don't feel like you got to have the answer to everything. You don't need to be a know-it-all. In fact, Use this opportunity to be a learn it all, right? Listen, get perspective. Because um, um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have a perspective that says, what the hell are we doing mm -hmm. together a joint venture? And by the way, why would we put together a joint venture with EMC? Um, and don't you realize that most joint ventures in the tech space fail? You got to listen to those perspectives. You got to get gain those perspectives. You got to take that input. And you got to shape accordingly. Um, and so it was it was incredible advice. Again, I wish I had had this earlier in my career uh, because it helped me start to think about perspective and getting 360 degrees of perspective um, when you're making very important, big kinds of decisions. 
um, and versus just you know react for react for reaction sake, which was by the way my style, and some would argue still to a degree is is a lot of my style today. And you need to have that ability, you know, to be decisive and make a decision. But I think it's got to be with you know perspective as well. So um, I you know that was a big moment for me, um, and I give Gary a ton of credit. Uh, for that coaching uh, in, in that period of time. Things were moving very fast. Awesome. And uh, if you think about the notion with uh, at X Factor as the uh, sponsor, so the, the kind of notion and importance of value selling, especially these days, any perspectives there? Yeah, I think it's I think it's everything, right? And again, value selling doesn't have to be you know services led or solution led, but but I think that's where customers are more apt uh, to take the phone call and to consume. Um, and so you know, having the perspective around what is that value, and, and value is going to be perceived or taken differently from customer to customer, and even I've seen customers within the same enterprise. Right. You know, depending upon who you're selling to, that value and how you position value uh, is going to be different. So um, value is always going to be derived from, uh, frankly, your your listening skills. Right. Uh, your empathy skills with the customer and putting trying to put yourself into the position that they're in uh, and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, maybe some of the headwinds that they're trying to achieve it in financial, operational competitive, what have you. Um, and so I think the, the value is derived in that listening and empathy um, skills that uh, that that uh, all of us can and should be developing. Yeah, and especially with this market, right? Everybody's trying to cut, spend, cut, spend. Right. So if you're selling whatever solution and you can equate that, as you said, the you know, financial operating metrics, say, hey, here's how we can help you generate revenue. Here's how we can help you save money. Maybe it's a compliance solution. Here's how we can help you, you know, stay out of jail, right? So those things would be things that the CFO would be all over versus something, other proposals that are just a bunch of techno mumbo jumbo, right? You could have, yeah, the 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 art of being able to do this is something that you know companies really need to master, and that's something X Factor does. So I um, I would also say one other thing, Randy, uh, as I'm thinking about this storytelling. Storytelling is yep. critical. Right. If you don't have storytelling skills and being able to tell a very rich story in in the in the words or the terms of customer. Right. You're, you're probably not going to be successful. Right. Uh, and that may be saying the obvious, but but I've seen it and I'm sure you have seen it so many times. Right. You know, sellers and others kind of come to things from the perspective of the company and the technology that that company is driving. That's great. It's great that you know that and you have that depth. Frankly, I don't at times, I'll be honest. But rather, how do you put yourself in that customer's shoes and be able to tell the story in terms that they'll be able to identify and go, oh, that's obvious. I get that. Like generative AI, right? That's a great opportunity today uh, to tell stories and use case stories that people will go, oh, okay, is it that? Is that simple? I got that. I could do that. Yeah. And and if you don't know, you could ask it, hey, tell me a story about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've done that a few times. <laughs> That's crazy. I was with uh, at a, a GTM fund event last night. Um, Scott Barker, we're talking about uh, storytelling than Brian Cotter from uh, Seismic, but just kind of that 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 art and notion versus where now the you know, generations are becoming so kind of more coin operated or relying on technology. They got the outbound, they got caught. It's okay. You know, so you need to have some art around kind of this whole notion and you're know, really nothing better than, than storytelling to explain what you do and how you do it and how you've done it more importantly for others. Right. Right. Absolutely. Totally. All right. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, so what were you going to say? I said, indeed it is. Indeed. There you go. So, um, we, we, we know each other a bit, not, not, not as well as some other guests, but uh, any uh, PG Randy story to tell? Well, I, I shared one earlier and, and uh, genuinely um, your advice, you know, to uh, to get yourself out there and uh, and do what I'm doing right now. And uh, I couldn't be any uh, more more grateful for that. But uh, but the one that uh, that uh, I do remember and. and and I know some of your prior guests uh, and those watching uh, will laugh when they uh, when they hear this. But 
Um, I remember when we, Cisco, were in the midst of coming to market uh, with this unified compute system, right? Next generation <laughs> oh, yeah. compute. And uh, of course, in those days, for context, for those that are, may not know this, you know, Hewlett Packard was a huge, in fact, I think one of the largest partners for Cisco. And so this was going to be a huge gamble. And um, I remember John Chambers going to see Mark Hurd, rest in peace, uh, to let him know that we were getting in the compute space. And that wasn't a very good day. Things fell apart from there. But there was this, um, this picture that kept going around uh, that kind of incented, not kind of, it incented all of us at Cisco. Yeah. Of this guy uh, over at HP, this guy by the name of Randy, uh, you know, who uh, was, um, let's just say, um, not not very kind to the the UCS platform. Yeah, they said uh, my, my prediction. Steve Burke at CR, and he said, "Okay, hey, Randy, make a little run through the hall." Okay, hey, any any predictions? I'm like, yeah, U UCS is dead in a year. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I remember it very well. Yeah, yeah. I'd have friends not, be sales meetings and Chambers would be putting it up, and yeah, blah blah blah. Right? Absolutely, and and that was motivation, pure motivation for guys like Frank Palumbo and Dom Delfino yeah. and myself and Scott Clark, and there's a whole cast of characters. But uh, uh, it's funny how the world uh, world goes, right? Uh, you compete, uh, but then you cooperate, and here we are co cooperating, and uh, that's the fun fun story about Randy. But there's a lot of you and I have. In fact, I think one of the other ones we were talking about not too long ago was uh, your early days at EMC running around in the uh, Northeast uh, when I was leading the AS400 business uh, and you were out uh, ripping out uh, IBM memory, which was of greater value in the market uh, and putting in EMC memory. And uh, it was two for one, in some cases, three for one and just trying to keep up. And and I, and I remember that. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, the guy that was doing that, that I was chasing, was this guy, Randy Seidel. So uh, uh, I'm sure there's many more of those if you just have a, have a bottle yeah. of wine. There you go. Lots of other great sellers, uh, uh, for sure. So anyway, so uh, Chris, you've been awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great, great perspectives. Uh, next week, uh, we've got Amit Bendoff, who's the CEO of Gong. His title topic is going to be The Future is Now, AI-Powered Revenue Team Transformation. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday morning, East Time, 9.30 to 10.30. Um, he's staying put in uh, Israel, given the uh, unfortunate circumstances and everything that's uh, happening over there. So we certainly uh, pray for everybody. So uh, Chris McCarthy, thank you. Chris Decker, uh, behind the scenes, thank you so much for your help. Uh, X Factor, thank you for your uh, sponsorship. Uh, if you want to uh, have a great operating plan and turn it into an always on operating plan, X, X Factor can help you, as well as uh, has a, a terrific value selling platform that you can use. Uh, for those that are members of sales community, thanks. For those that are not, feel free to go to salescommunity.com slash fall free and join. So uh, everybody have a great uh, re rest of the week. Thanks, thanks. Randy.